Ja, liebe Anwesende hier in diesem, also in, in diesem Meridiansaal und liebe Anwesende, die, weil hier der Raum voll ist, in dem, was wir Rudolf Wolf Saal nennen, im Haus sind, aber mit der Übertragung vorlieb nehmen. Und ich würde dann einfach bitten, die, dass diejenigen, die Fragen haben, sich von dem Wolf in den Meridiansaal begeben, weil sozusagen der Ort der Diskussion natürlich hier ist, wo ähm, die ganze Aufnahmetechnik, als sollte jemand nicht einverstanden sein, dass er oder sie mit seinem oder ihrem Beitrag aufgenommen wird, möge jetzt die Hand erheben oder auf immer schweigen. Also das bitte die, die im Wolfsaal sitzen für die Diskussion, wenn sie sozusagen etwas sagen wollen, gerne hierher kommen mögen. Also ich begrüße die An- und auch Anwesenden ganz herzlich am Kollegium Helvetikum in der Sempersternwarte. Das Kollegium, gemeinsam getragen von der ETH Zürich, der Universität Zürich und seit August diesen Jahres auch von der Zürcher Hochschule der Künste, ist nicht nur das einzige Institute of Advanced Study in der Schweiz, sondern labelt sich seit mittlerweile zwölf Jahren als Laboratorium für Transdisziplinarität. War damals Transdisziplinarität noch ein programmatischer Kampf oder zumindest Profilierungsbegriff, so ist die Bezeichnung heute in der Meinung vieler, ich darf aus dem Abstract von Andrea Breit zitieren, zum Keyword mit Patina geworden. Zum Catchword, so Sabine Maaßen, ehemalige Associate Fellow des Kollegiums und wie Andrea Breit, wissenschaftliche Beirätin für die aktuelle Fellow-Periode. Ja, also wir hatten Keyword mit Patina, Catchword, ja schon fast zum, wie dies Uwe Perksen an Beispielen wie Entwicklung, Kommunikation, Ressource, Strategie, Struktur oder auch Identität herausgearbeitet hat. Schon fast also ist Transdisziplinarität zum Plastikwort, zumindest in der Akademie und in der Forschungs- und Wissenspolitik geworden. Transdisziplinarität scheint demnach, so ließe sich der Befund, bei genauem Hinsehen vielleicht am präzisesten fassen, zu etwas scheinbar Selbstverständlichem geworden zu sein. Ein Befund, der mich als Volkskundler natürlich aufhorchen lässt. Beschaff, beschäftige ich mich doch qua Profession seit vielen Jahren eben genau mit dem scheinbar Selbstverständlichen. Ist es geradezu meine Passion, Selbstverständlichkeiten zu befragen und in Frage zu stellen. Wir haben deshalb beschlossen, unserem Kollegium Helvetikum in den kommenden vier Jahren nicht nur mit unserem Leitthema Digital Societies auseinanderzusetzen, uns nicht damit zufrieden zu geben, ein Ort des Doing Interdisciplinarity zu sein, für welchen, ganz in dem Sinne von Florian Dombois, ich zitiere aus seinem Abstract und hoffe natürlich, dass die Aussage auch von seiner Erfahrung als kulturwissenschaftlicher Gast und ehemaliger Associate Fellow am Collegium Helvetikum grundiert sind, als Ort des Doing Interdisciplinarity, für welchen, Zitat, Zusammenarbeit zum gegenseitigen Risiko sich in Frage stellen und in Frage stellen lassen, Zeit und Menschen zur Verfügung stehen zu haben, konstitutiv sind, sondern das ist ein bisschen ein vertragstes ähm, Satzgebilde, es geht aber grammatisch auf, ähm, <lacht> sondern auch Ort und Instanz des Reflecting Transdisciplinarity zu sein. Ja, Quote Capita Tod Sententiae. Bei Terenz hieß es übrigens im zweiten vorchristlichen Jahrhundert waren es noch Quote Homines Tod Sententiae. Also nach einer Auslegeordnung zu Transdisziplinaritätsverständnissen Zunächst an den drei Trägerhochschulen, die Tatsache, auch eine Kunsthochschule dabei zu haben, verkompliziert oder positiver, dafür grammatisch unkorrekt ausgedrückt, verkomplexiert den Sachverhalt auf angemessene Weise und nach einer ersten Sichtung aktueller Diskussionen zu Begriff und Konzept, Transdisziplinarität, so Diskussionen denn überhaupt geführt werden, war schnell klar, die Bestandsaufnahme in Sachen Transdisziplinarität in Sachen, die, in Sachen Transdisziplinarität in den ersten Monaten unserer neuen Fellow-Periode nicht nur quasi auf der Arbeitsebene zu belasten 
und uns ein wie auch immer geartetes eigenes Verständnis zurecht zu schustern, zu zimmern oder was der Handwerksmetaphern mehr sind, sondern auf einer quasi übergeordneten Ebene weiterzuführen. Dass dies heute, beziehungsweise um ganz präzise zu sein, bereits Ende September als Jürgen Mittelstraß in der Auftaktveranstaltung unserer Fellow-Periode seine Sichtweisen eines systemischen Verhältnisses von Disziplinarität, Interdisziplinarität, Transdisziplinarität und zurück dargelegt hat, dass dies also heute und morgen in besonderem Maße der Fall sein kann, verdanken wir den Umstand, dass sich unsere Wunschreferentinnen und Wunschreferenten schnell auf unsere Anfragen zur Teilnahme und unsere Fragen zum Konzept, das im internen Jargon bald einmal nur noch als T firmierte, eingelassen zu haben. Dafür schon einmal ganz herzlichen Dank. Wir erhoffen uns dank und mit Ihrer und Eurer Hilfe einiges. Zum einen hoffen wir, dass die Zugänge aus Kultur- und Sozialwissenschaften, aus Wissensforschung und Wissenschaftsgeschichte aus Naturwissenschaften und den Perspektiven der bildenden Kunst und der Artistic Research, dass mit Beiträgen wie Elisabeth Bronfens Überlegungen zum Crossmapping und jenem von David A. Edwards, der auf den Experimenten und Erfahrungen in seinem Laboratoire beruht, dass also mit Beiträgen, die auf die Perspektive des Doings abheben, wir eine breite Diskussion mit vielen Anknüpfungsfragen in Fragestellungsmöglichkeiten und kreativen Reibungsflächen herstellen können. Hoffen tun wir zum Zweiten, dass heute und morgen das, was Michal Lilials nicht zuletzt aus ihrer Erfahrung als langjährige Leiterin des Israel Institute for Advanced Studies heraus als Shared Principle of oder Four Projects that Fit the Notion of Transdisciplinarity bezeichnet hat, nämlich to engage in an unstructured project and a dialogue that often lead to the unexpected. Hoffen wir also, dass zumindest einiges davon mit den kommenden Beiträgen und Diskussionen angestoßen wird. Zum, zugleich und zum Dritten hoffen bzw. versprechen wir uns, nicht nur mit der heutigen Tagung, sondern auch mit unserem Tun in den Fellow-Projekten und Aktivitäten, nicht zuletzt aber auch dadurch, dass wir in den kommenden Jahren immer wieder das Konzept Transdisziplinarität auf den Prüfstand und zur Diskussion stellen wollen, zu einer neuen Kultur der Interaktion beizutragen, wie sie Hans-Jörg Reinberger als zwingend für ein Zitat irreduzibel plural gewordenes Universum des Wissens bezeichnet hat. Unsere Vorträge finden, das, finden, das waren wir der Ansicht, dass dem Projekt Transdisziplinarität schuldig zu sein, jeweils mit einer Response statt. Und die Respondentinnen und Respondenten kommen zum einen in der Regel hier aus dem Haus oder sind ihm sehr verbunden und sind zum anderen aus dem jeweils nicht disziplinären Kontext der Vortragenden. Das war ganz bewusstes Wahlprinzip. Zum Schluss möchte ich noch gerne das ominöse Wir, das ich in den vergangenen paar Monaten als, per, als bevorzugtes Personalpronomen gebraucht habe, etwas weiter aufdröseln. Das ist weder Majestat ist noch Pluralis Modestie, sondern wir, das meint zunächst die Mitarbeitenden des Collegium Helveticum, das Eventbüro, Andrea Truttmann und Nina Cantoni, deren allererste größere Veranstaltung das heute ist, das meint unser Kommunikationsteam um Martin Schmid, unsere Stabsmitarbeiter und Mitdenker Harald Atmansbacher, meint Christian Ritter, mit dem die meisten der Vortragenden schon ausführlich Kontakt gehabt haben, und meint nicht zuletzt Hartmut von Sass, auf den wesentliche Teile der Konzeption zurückgehen. Ganz herzlichen Dank von meiner Seite schon zu Beginn der Konferenz. Bevor ich jetzt aber ins allgemeine Danken weiterkomme, selbstverständlich Ihnen, den Diskutanten, den referierenden Respondenten und so weiter und so weiter, wünsche ich uns allen eine gute Tagung, sehr, sehr, sehr ertragreiche Diskussionen und übergebe an Hartmut von Sass, der durch den heutigen Nachmittag und Abend führen wird. Ich will gar nicht äh, lange rumreden, sondern sofort äh, in Medias Res gehen und äh, habe die Freude nun, äh, unsere erste Vortragende vorzustellen. Es ist Professor Dr. Sabine Maaßen von der TU 
München. Sie studierte Soziologie, Linguistik und Psychologie an der Universität Bielefeld. Bielefeld gibt es also tatsächlich. Sie promovierte und äh, habilitierte in äh, Soziologie, war dann ähm, von 1988 bis 1994 wissenschaftliche Assistentin am Zentrum für interdisziplinäre Forschung, gerade für unser Thema ja gerade institutionell eine der Hauptadressaten, äh, um dann von 1994 bis 2001 Forschungskoordinatorin am Max-Planck-Institut für psychologische Forschung zu sein. Seit 2001 war sie dann tätig als Professorin für Wissenschaftsforschung und Wissenschaftssoziologie an der Universität Basel, bevor sie dann im Dezember 2013 einen Ruf an die Technische Universität in München annahm, um einen Stiftungslehrstuhl zu übernehmen für Wissenschaftssoziologie. Ihre Forschungsschwerpunkte liegen in der sozialwissenschaftlichen Wissenschaftsforschung und ihre aktuellen Arbeiten konzentrieren sich dabei vor allen Dingen auf die Soziologie der Neurowissenschaften und der Technowissenschaften. Und äh, bevor wir nun gleich den Titel hören, der auf Englisch ist und der, der Vortrag wird auch auf Englisch sein, wir werden das also hier bilingual machen, Engineering, Collaboration, Trading Differences, möchte ich auch unseren Respondenten vorstellen, der ähm, dann ähm, einige Punkte äh, zusammentragen wird als Response auf Sabine. Das ist Christoph Schenker von der ZHDK. Er ist, hm? Ach, er ist krank. Äh, ah, okay. Gut, dann äh, werde ich... Dann, das wusste ich nicht. Ich kann natürlich auch Kranke vorstellen. Also alles, was hier steht, ist sicher richtig. Ähm, gut, also es wäre eigentlich Christoph Schenker gewesen von der ZHDK. Äh, nun ist es also Harald Abmannsbacher, ähm, der äh, Physiker ist und der zum Stab äh, gehört. Er ist ja schon auch erwähnt worden ähm, und der dann auch morgen noch einmal eine äh, Response halten wird. Äh, und deshalb freue ich mich jetzt auf den Vortrag von Sabine Maaßen, Engineering, Collaboration und Trading Differences. Du hast das Wort. Okay, the idea that disciplines may not be enough for studying, understanding, or even solving problems at hand is not new at all. It all began with the notion of interdisciplinarity and has, began, has been promoted by several movements. A brief sketch of the story of interdisciplinarity may remind us all that the urge to go beyond the scope of disciplines is part and parcel of reflecting on science since the 20th century. One of these movements, you know it all, is called the Unity of Science Movement. It campaigned in the 1930s and 40s, one important group being the Vienna Circle. It sought a common empirical attitude toward all the sciences and strove to develop a single, comprehensive scientific language. This endeavor has later on been dismissed as utterly reductionist. On this account, different disciplines would not collaborate with each other, but rather reduce to one basic scientific discipline, physics, that is. In this tradition, the concept of interdisciplinarity for a longer time was mainly driven by epistemic interests. Only in the 1960s, things changed. The call for interdisciplinarity gained a second momentum in the US and in Europe with a student unrest in the late 1960s. Here it began to enter the political arena. One of the demands during this unrest was for disciplinary structures in universities to be replaced by more holistic concepts that were closer to practical life. In addition, political circles became infused by planning on the basis of scientific knowledge, especially in the realm of education. In this context, interdisciplinarity became to denote reform, innovation and progress, way beyond academia. In 1972, after extensive cross-national research, the OECD published its seminal volume on interdisciplinarity, designed to promote interdisciplinarity in teaching and university organizational structures. Several other studies and conferences followed. However, when the OECD published Interdisciplinarity Revisited, it, revisited 15 years later, the sobering result was that Interdisciplinarity has lost its momentum and disciplines were, in fact, strengthened again. 
in the course of the 1990s, interdisciplinarity came to be associated with yet another, a third trend, namely with the label knowledge society. The observation was that science and society moved ever closer to each other. Virtually every domain of society was realized to be suffused by science and technology, constantly challenging society and its members. Accordingly, research needed to be directed towards effectiveness and relevance. Quote, new modes of knowledge production, or mode two, were called for. These and other concepts maintained, among other things, that research had to meet novel requirements. Next to being empirically sound, it had to be economically profitable, politically relevant, and socially robust. Notably, it had to be problem-oriented and targeted at solutions rather than playing academic glass bead games. Thus, from the 1990s onwards, the prime condition and goal for doing an interdisciplinary is its contribution to governing contemporary society by relevant scientific and technological knowledge. At this point in time, approximately, we start talking about transdisciplinarity for good. As Jürgen Mittelstrass put it, quote, transdisciplinarity is a form of scientific work which arises in cases concerning the solution of non-scientific problems. For instance, the environmental, energy, and healthcare policy problems as well as intra-scientific principle concerning the order of scientific knowledge and scientific research itself. In both cases, transdisciplinarity is a principle of research and science, one which becomes operative wherever it is impossible to define or attempt to solve problems within the boundaries of subjects or disciplines or where, where one goes beyond such definitions. End of quote. So, Today, there is no doubt about it. Interdisciplinarity, and more specifically, transdisciplinarity, are the most popular catchwords used in present-day knowledge politics. In actual fact, they are often used interchangeably, the reason presumably being that they are united by one common appeal. Both terms carry the idea of effectively countering over-specialization in research, development, and teaching, on the other hand, though, they carry the hope for more effectively dealing with issues that are regarded as too complex as to be dealt with by one field of expertise only. This is also mirrored in the politics of funding agencies. <coughs> Prior to 1980, they spoke in the name of science to the national states, articulating the needs of science. After 1980, funding agencies began to speak to science, urgent reforms and increased cooperation among scientists and beyond. Funding schemes today not only govern the choice of topics, agendas, methods, etc., but also with the dissemination of outcomes and the ongoing networking activities of all stakeholders involved. At the peak of this trend, the grand challenges have appeared. They address global problems such as climate change or energy security and call for novel approaches and technical solutions. As of 2000, approximately, this sets the stage for interdisciplinarity anew. In EU parlance, transdisciplinarity is reframed as science in society with society for society. Now, despite this overwhelming rhetoric, virtually nobody denies transdisciplinary collaboration to be easier said than done. Why then can't we leave it at that? There are at least two reasons for it. Politically speaking, collaboration is strongly linked to innovation. Normatively speaking, it is supposed to be inclusive as it exploits a broader knowledge base and involves a broader set of stakeholders. As a consequence, transdisciplinarity is politically overdetermined solutions for problems and epistemically underdetermined. See below, I will talk about this later. Most telling is the rhetoric attached to collaboration. More often than not, it abounds with strong unifying ambitions such as joint goals, shared values, and last but not least, consensus. 
This, however, is neither the rationale not, nor the practice of collaboration. Rather, it is characterized by differences and by boundaries. We cooperate because we differ in our notions and our values. The different factions working together, say, scientists of various disciplines, industrial actors, concerned citizens, typically do not share their views when starting their cooperation, and chances are that they won't share it after the cooperation. But maybe they come to know the reasons for the differences in perspective and find out about a new way to frame a problem so as to proceed despite the differences that will remain. The magic formula being informed consent. In this view, transdisciplinarity is all about working with differences and boundaries between disciplines, stakeholders, organizations, values. The ultimate trick for collaboration to happen is to engineer socio-intellectual spaces which allow for trading differences, a dissent even, in a productive way. Now, in order to substantiate my claim, let me begin by a closer look at collaborative practices and its value proposition first. Thereafter, I'd like to talk about some of the obstacles, then about the emergence of the science of team science to improve collaborative expertise. Fourth, I would like to elaborate on the role of boundaries for collaboration. Fifth, I will approach collaboration with the help of concepts from my home turf, science and technology studies. Ultimately, and please forgive me, I will plead for idiocy to play a decisive role in interdisciplinarity. But let's proceed step by step. For a start, let's, us briefly remind, let's us briefly remind ourselves of the value proposition of collaborative practice, and interdisciplinarity in particular, in different domains, such as problem solving, commercial development of a new product, or in science. In the areas of problem solving or of the commercial development of a new product, service or process, of, uh, or process the objectives may be tightly defined. Here, inter- or transdisciplinarity is meant to make use of different skills or analytic perspectives. To frame the problem or the opportunity to bring to bear different kinds of knowledge so as to achieve a richer solution. The belief is that interdisciplinarity increases the likelihood of a radical solution to the problem or to achieving commercialization of the opportunity. In academic, curiosity-driven research, the main objective is directed towards new insights created by the new conjunction of differing interests and perspectives. Different disciplines combine in ways that may stimulate breakthroughs. Such research may eventually result in breakthrough opportunities for later commercial application or as a foundation for innovative cultural and social action, yet this is not the primary objective. Next, with these different value propositions of co collaboration in different domains and for different purposes, we should also talk briefly about the different types of collaborative research. For since about the 1990s, it has become customary to differentiate at least three ideal types of collaborative work with and beyond science. There is multidisciplinarity. Representatives of different disciplines or research fields explore the discipline-specific approaches toward a joint topic. Normally, the goal is to explore the different knowledge bases at hand and to find out where possible bridges might be. Interdisciplinarity, in this case, it is required that all members of an interdisciplinary team refer to each other, beginning with the formulation of a joint problem, using joint or complementary methods and or a joint theoretical framework, and so on. And finally, transdisciplinarity. Here, extra scientific actors join the interdisciplinary team, administrators, users, patients, managers, they are all regarded as stakeholders who contribute pertinent knowledge and values to the problem at hand. The integration of their local knowledge is especially relevant when defining the problem and evaluating the result. Now, when it comes to actual collaborative research and development, 
you will regularly find all these forms throughout the whole process. And by the way, also disciplinary ones. A group may, for instance, negotiate a problem first with the stakeholders, then branch out into disciplinary working groups, then discuss interim results with stakeholders again, and so on. Thus, talking about multi-inter or transdisciplinary collaboration is meant to draw our attention to the fact that different kinds of collaborative activities exist and that they vary in their demands as to lay out, understand, and actually work with different kinds of knowledge and values. In this perspective, transdisciplinarity is the most demanding form of cooperation as it calls for the interaction in the face of different disciplines, different organizations, different sets of knowledges, different values. Now, given the prevent, uh, present focus on both economic innovation and societal acceptance, we ever more often engage in transdisciplinary interactions, such as between scientists, engineers, citizens, policymakers, and managers. Indeed, for those who are committed to solving complex social technical problems, collaboration among diverse stakeholders is key. Transdisciplinary research makes science and decision making interactive through the co production of knowledge with society. Accordingly, Success is often deemed to be a function to, of the degree to which science, management, planning, policy, and practice are interactively involved in issue framing, knowledge production, and knowledge application. At this point, the question arises whether and how collaboration is, in fact, doable. And this is an important question, for there are considerable obstacles when it comes to practicing collaborative activity in science and beyond. Among the most imminent obstacles in doing inter or transdisciplinarily, we find epistemological differences, different conventions regarding co the collection and analysis of data, organizational aspects, as well as institutional conditions for pursuing interdisciplinary projects. The obstacles show even more distinctly in cooperation across epistemic cultures. Let me mention them just very briefly. When it comes to epistemological aspects, clearly positivist methodolo methodologies among natural scientists and constructivist methodologies among social scientists don't easily sit side by side. Moreover, while natural scientists from different disciplines may cooperate on the basis of their positivist methodologies, cooperation among the multi pragmatic social sciences seems much less convenient. In addition, both camps prefer different research designs, for instance, experimental versus explorative. As to different research conventions, disciplines, notably those belonging to different cultures, also differ in their views on how research should be done properly. This pertains, among other things, to the duration of data collection and analysis, to different levels of analysis, to different ways of communicating results, as well as to different jargons. Particularly tricky, however, are terms that are seemingly shared by all members of an interdisciplinary team, yet differ as to their meaning. Examples are code, information, model, what have you. As to organization, or organizing interdisciplinary teams, this is a very demanding task. Coordinating schedules of team members, moderating team meetings via various media, email, Skype, etc., requires time, requires staff. In this dimension, main obstacles show in the difficulty to maintain high commitment of all involved. This is serious, given that there are hardly any chances to sanction low commitment. Institutional aspects. The problem of maintaining commitment aggravates in view of the fact that the involvement in interdisciplinary programs counts as prestigious in general, yet is hardly contrib contrib contributing to one's reputation, especially in terms of publications. There is hardly a journal for interdisciplinary products, let alone such that are listed in the Social Science or Science Citation Index. Equally thorny is the question whether or not young researchers should engage in interdisciplinary activities as they are time-consuming and risky when it comes to finding an academic post. <coughs> now, allow me to terminate this list of obstacles at this point. It is easy to imagine 
that the collaboration beyond the realm of science is also haunted by many more differences and boundaries. I will get to this point a bit later. Now, there's hope, apparently. Given all these obstacles on the one hand, and research questions that grow ever more complex and thus require to joining forces on the other hand, we seem to be in need of expertise as regards doing interdisciplinarity, well, transdisciplinarity, next to an abundance of anecdotal evidence and best practice recommendations, a whole new branch called the science of team science has emerged in order to analyze and improve collaborative activities. Today, notably policymakers and major funders are pushing scientists to collaborate across disciplines, institutions, and even nations under the new banner of team science. Quote, the emerging field of the science of team science encompasses both conceptual and methodological strategies aimed at understanding and enhancing the processes and outcomes of collaborative team-based research. End of quote. Topics by team science include definitions and models of team science, measurement and evaluation of team sciences, disciplinary dynamics and team science, structure and context for teams, institutional support and professional development for teams, management and organization for teams, and characteristics and dynamics of teams. Team science is, of course, based on multiple methods, quantitative and qualitative ones. It mostly relies on psychological and managerial theories and concepts. Here's an example. Through analysis of in-depth interviews with members of highly successful research teams and others who did not meet their goals or ended because of conflicts, Bennett and Gatlin identified key elements that are critical for team success and effectiveness. Among the most important of these is trust. Without trust, the team dynamic runs the risk of deteriorating over time. Other critical factors include developing a shared vision, strategically identifying team members, and purposefully building the team, promoting disagreement while containing conflict, and setting clear expectations for sharing credit and authorship. Moreover, self-awareness and strong communication skills contribute greatly to effective leadership and management strategies of scientific teams. While all successful teams share the characteristic of effectively carrying out these activities, there is no single formula for the execution with every leader exemplifying different strengths and weaknesses. Successful scientific collaborations have strong leaders who are self-aware and are mindful of the many elements critical for supporting the science at the center of effort. This is what they say, the science of team science. Who would deny these findings? But... Somehow, they seem to quick fix and manage the issue of doing collaboration rather than taking the obstacles above mentioned seriously. The science of team science is, so it seems, but a new word for an old challenge called cooperating within and beyond science, despite of all differences in perspectives involved. Differences, in their view, need to be bridged in short time in a problem-solving manner and to be attractive for all involved. What does attractive mean? Of course, it needs to be reputable for the different disciplines involved. It needs to be innovative for industrial actors involved, legitimacy raising for political actors involved, sustainable for ecologically minded citizens involved. In view of these and other ambitions, heterogeneous ambitions, the new field of the science of team science offers in their view, to shed light on what makes effective teams in order to produce the best outcomes in, in no time. As opposed to this rather managerial approach, and in view of the obstacles mentioned above, I rather plead for something else, for a different take on collaborative science. Ultimately, it is all about acknowledging boundaries, and it is all about doing boundary work. So let's begin with a richer notion of boundaries first. Knowledge is developed within communities or organizations that are bounded in some way or the others. Boundaries separate one institution from another, one discipline from another, government departments from companies, NGOs from political parties, research and development from manufacturing. Organizations and communities each rely on and are sustained by common yet always specific bodies of knowledge. 
boundaries cut across our attempts to cooperate and need not to be bypassed, but rather to be addressed. Indeed, although disciplinary boundaries are often described as barriers to the collaboration, they are also essential as they do not simply contain a particular set of facts or methods or theories. Rather, they are about an epistemic culture. It is about the organization and the transmission of knowledge, including a deep-rooted notion of what is relevant and how things should be done. This is what Fleck would have termed specific thought styles characteristic for specific thought collectives. And this continues with organizational boundaries. Doing collaborative work in academia, industry, government research, or NGOs shapes individual values and intellectual styles in a way that is preserved even as a person moves beyond sec between sectors or between organizations and disciplines. It is thus important to recognize that these different organizations do have different cultures of knowledge, knowledge that is valued, bounded, it may be not even recognized as being knowledge when viewed from an outsider. If collaborative groups are willing to accept each other's knowledge as different, yet possibly useful, two things are mandatory. Much listening, much talking. Collaborating groups in this respect are contexts of enforced stimulation. In these contexts where heterogeneous actors, groups or organizations meet for hours and hours, over and over again. Explaining, explaining again, arguing, reframing, experimenting, and admitting that one still doesn't understand what the other one is saying, yet by asking again here and there, glimpses of bridging ideas might come up. However, more often than not, something else might happen. Ideas, arguments, solutions are likely to be different from those that were expected. Not to be expressible in terms of the discipline or group or organization that originated the initiative. May involve new questions or complete reformulation of objectives. May arise only after a longer time, perhaps long after the initiative has formally ended. However, there are strategies to respond to these types of outcomes. Already at the outset of collaborative endeavors, one should, for instance, define unexpected questions as a valuable outcome. Deliver other minor outcomes as early wins. Manage expectations by presenting the research as an attempt to produce interesting failures. Valuable questions, early wins, valuable, uh, interesting failures are all strategies to deal with differences and boundaries. And another important strategy is to look for shared objects, such as sketches, prototypes, concepts, models, theories. They have as a focus around which to articulate developing inno innovative perspectives. They also act to build trust among external stakeholders, for a concrete artifact confers validity by its very existence. For a major obstacle to many interdisciplinary endeavors is that their objectives are otherwise not expressible within the value system of one or more of the contributing disciplines or organization. They all have to refer to one boundary object. Now, these ideas and strategies, if only mentioned by way of example, strongly rely on notions of my home disciplines, SDS, among, among many other things, SDS is interested in understanding and shaping the empirical practices of doing collaboration within and beyond science. Among the most prominent concepts are the notions of boundary objects, trading zones, interactional expertise, and community of practice. Let's consider them step by step. Joint concepts, real-world problems or prototypes, are perfect examples of so-called boundary objects suggested by Susan Lay Starr and James Algorizma. By definition, quote, boundary objects are both plastic enough to adapt to local needs and constraints of the several parties employing them, yet robust enough to maintain a common identi identity across sites. They have different meanings in different social worlds, but their structure is common enough to more than one world to make them recognizable a means of translation, 
The creation and management of boundary objects is key in developing and maintaining coherence across intersecting social worlds. Starr and Griezmann in their study are concerned with the problem of how members of different social worlds, such as science, industry, NGOs, manage to successfully cooperate. Cooperation, they argue, is necessary to ensure rel reliability across domains and to gather information which retains integrity across time, space, and local contingencies. But, and this is important, it does not require consensus nor unity. The boundary object in their study is the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, whose institutionalization involved actors as different as university administrators, amateur collectors, farmers, philanthropists, and their specific interests. On my reading of Starr and Griezmann's account, a boundary object is both a product of and a facilitator for the multiple interactions needed to engineer productive cooperation among multiple social worlds, despite of all the differences in perspectives remaining. The empirical observation is that in their course of enacting, collaborative groups often manage a kind of trading zone in which the various subcultures, each with their own language, develop a joint language. Quote, and some experts even learn to use the language of another research community in ways that are indistinguishable from expert practitioners of that community. A quote by Collins and Evans. To this end, Gallison presented the interaction of experimenters and theoreticians in terms of the trading zones described by anthropologists. The latter have extensively studied how different groups with radically different views of the world can not only exchange good, goods, but also depend essentially on trading them. Analog analogously, within a certain arena defined by a problem or a task, two or more dissimilar groups can find common ground and trade as yet unknown, possibly complementary or opposing views, concepts, instruments, methods, and so on, worked out in exquisite local detail without global agreement, just for this particular problem at hand. A trading zone is at the same time necessary for all factions involved in order to interact without the necessity of overall consensus. The ability to converse expertly in more than one discipline is called interactional expertise. For example, somebody doing STS research on physics without actually practicing physics may acquire interactional expertise. Interaction and expertise is developed through interaction without expert knowledge or practical immersion in a slightly different scientific domain. To be sure, this is not exceptional in science, rather normal. Scientific practice requires all, all of us to develop such expertise, for interactional expertise is the medium of, say, communication in peer review in science, in review committees, in interdisciplinary projects, and in public understanding of science. It is also the medium of specialist journalists and interpretative methods in the social sciences. That is to say, beyond specialist expertise in the particular field we evaluate or we communicate about, we create closeness and credibility for judgment by diving into and getting familiar with the other field. This is what uh, Helga Novotny thing, um, describes as expertise is always transgressive. To sum up, a trading zone can gradually become a new area of expertise facilitated by interactional expertise and involving in negotiations over boundary objects. If this so happens, we see a collectivity emerging that is not a scientific community, yet neither an arbitrary collectivity anymore. Rather, a community of practice emerged that is characterized by three interrelated concepts, mutual engagement, joint enterprise, and shared repertoire. Via mutual engagement, trading partners establish norms and build collaborative relationships. By joint exp uh, enterprise, they create a domain that binds them together. Finally, as part of its practice, the community produces a set of communal resources or a shared repertoire. And this is my message now. Viewed from the perspective of these concepts, collaborative enterprises can both acknowledge and capitalize on differences in epistemic, normative, or organizational culture. 
What they essentially do is that they help to see us engineering social intellectual spaces around a certain problem, be it primarily academic, technical, economic, or social in nature. By trading our respective concepts or instruments, we build up boundary objects that in turn facilitate the development of interactional expertise. In the course of this happening, communities of practice emerge. More often than not, however, inter- or transdisciplinary endeavors are only temporary ones. They convene always a specific set of partners, targeting always a different problem. For instance, I myself did collaborative work on free will with neuroscientists, criminologists, philosophers, on the social foundations of nations with biologists, geneticists, social biologists, historians of science, and anthropologists, and I'm planning on yet another one on care robotics with roboticists, neuroengineers, caregivers, patients, and so on. Given all these specificities, can one thus possibly become an expert in collaboration? I think yes. After some practice in engineering trading zones, one can indeed acquire a collaborative expertise in its own right that may be applied to various novel constellations and problems. And now I come to... Final point, given that we deal not only with differences in knowledge, but also as regards power, say, different reputations, political status, collaboration may differ considerably. Magminovsky distinguishes four scenarios for such collaborations. Conflict. Research might start with an interdisciplinary intent, but research go their separate ways. Tolerant ambivalence. Researchers from different disciplines can coexist, even contribute to the same project, but the analytical domains are largely and remain largely separate. Mutual identification and cooperation. There are theories and analytical tools that can be transferred if effort is put into communication, consistency of models and concepts, and crossover applications of theory. And finally, fundamental reorientation and recombination of knowledge claims. I agree with McMinowski that in collaborative practice too, knowledge mixes with power. And, quote, the choice is whether to recognize the situation and deal with the implications as transparently, methodically, and consciously as possible, or to deny this aspect of the interdisciplinary interface and let these forces operate behind a screen of tradition, assumptions, and unexplicated values. End of quote. Chances are slim that we arrive at uh, scenario four, yet there's hope, if and only if we allow idiocy to play a role. That's my final point. This figure is, of course, a new, no, newest kid on the blog in STS research on collaborative practice. It is, as you might assume already, modeled after Dostoevsky. The idiot allows us, or the figure, the idea is, it allows us to slow down to take time to question our own assumptions about a problem and to reinterpret it. <laughs> Following this idea, the boundary object, for instance, affords an opportunity to engage in a process of inventive problem making. As a methodology, the proactive idiocy is not so much about problems or facts, but about the process of emergence of new relations which may reconfigure what's the very fact or the problem might be altogether. In collaborative settings, the sheer presence of different sets of knowledge values provokes rethinking what each one of the participants considered evident before. On this account, interdisciplinary settings are spaces to say, I don't get it. I think otherwise. Please explain again. Let's try it differently over and over again. And precisely for this reason, Engineering, collabor engineering collaboration as an idiotic practice needs nerves and courage and trust, and it remains interactional expertise notwithstanding an ongoing experiment. So ultimately, collaboration in and beyond science needs men and women of conviction, in other words, committed collaborators that are courageous enough to engage in idiotic practices. Thank you. <laughs> Hartmut introduced me already. My name is Harald Atmanspacher. 
I am working here at the Collegium, and my original profession where I'm coming from is physics. So I'm a scientist, or I have been a scientist. And as you all know, scientists are always practical people. So the first thing I want to do is uh, give you a little bit of an illustration of what I understood from Sabine's talk, what multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and transdisciplinarity can be about. I mean, it's only an example. It's not, a, not an encyc encyclopedic definition. I just want to use the example of a book that Sabine published half a year ago. You may still know it. It's, it's half a year ago already. It's a book on, um, on a methodological principle of, I would say, almost all science. Uh, and the topic is reproducibility. Now, um, since almost all sciences use or even depend on this principle, uh, one could have, um, I would say one could even call this principle, this methodological principle, a, an object of transdisciplinary research in a weaker sense than you mentioned. I mean, Sabine was pointing out that transdisciplinary, from her point of view, actually has to do with uh, the interface to society, to stakeholders, to uh, patients, you said, to users, and so on. I, th I would say this is the, maybe the strongest and most difficult version of transdisciplinarity well, I would like to argue there are weaker forms, too. For instance, uh, you mentioned STS, right? Science and Technology Studies. In a certain sense, this is already transdisciplinary work because you're looking at individual disciplines from a kind of meta-perspective. Philosophy of science is the same. Sociology of science, you know better than me. History of science and, 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 and also methodological principles in science. Now, um, in this book, of course, we have the aspect of multidisciplinary, multidisciplinarity involved because uh, the book collects examples from the physical sciences, uh, from the life sciences, and also from the social sciences where exactly also the interface to, uh, to, to society is expressed. Okay. But then also there, is, there are many aspects of interdisciplinarity involved. For instance, like in, um, in biological sciences, in life sciences, it's a, it's a huge problem which, which comes up more and more, crosses the surface, uh, the issue of translation between different levels of, for instance, drug development. You start with molecular biology in the lab, then you go to the preclinical trials, then you go to clinical trials, and what, at whatever level you achieve results, you do not know, in many cases, how to translate those results to the next level. So this is, for sure, a certain, a very, a very, very precise uh, kind of interdisciplinary work, and it has to do with, probably, with boundary work and, and all the topics that you mentioned. Now, I, think, I also think that uh, this whole um, work is, has a lot to do with transdisciplinarity because uh, methodological principles, not only like reproducibility itself, but also like um, different statistical tools of analysis, are of course used in many different disciplines. And they have to be used in different ways. Right? So you have to find ways, you know, if you, if you want to, want to um, uh, consider statistical tools, a very simple idea. In different disciplines, you have to find a way how to go from, the, from their general, let me say, appearance to their individual applications in each particular instance, and that, I would say, is truly tra transdisciplinary work. Right. So, um, in addition to being a multidisciplinary book, which is simply characterized by the fact that there is some kind of additive collection of, of different sciences, different disciplines here. This is also a, an interdisciplinary book facing on interfaces, boundaries or interfaces. And it's a transdisciplinary book, maybe in a, in the, in the, in a weaker sense than Sabine pointed out, because um, this book offers meta-perspectives with respect to individual sciences. I know you all know this book. 
And if you don't know it yet, <laughs> you can, it's not expensive, you can purchase it. And I mean, if you do it real quick, then we could even offer you a discount price. <laughs> okay, and it's, it's a very nice book because Sabine has produced it. <laughs> now, <clears throat> so this is point one. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is about the notion of boundaries, which you focused on um, quite a bit. Uh, to me, it, it always appears that uh, the notion of a boundary is um, is maybe from a from a pragmatic point of view, if you want to do interdisciplinary work, something that already sets a kind of distinction that uh, um, from from which many people shy away because it's just considered as something which, as a boundary, uh, maybe should not be crossed. So I always have um, favored another notion, the notion of an interface, something like that. And then, of course, you, we all know that an interface is never inf infinitesimally thin. It has extension. And I think that this is another advantage of the notion of an interface because it already expresses that people working together in a team have to at least to some extent uh, um, introduce themselves into the, into the area on the other side of the interface. Because the interface is not, is not infinitesimally thin anyway. So you have to, at least to some, to some extent, go into the other, into the other um, domain. Um, so in addition to trust and curiosity and perseverance, I think an extremely important criterion for people working on interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary projects uh, should be the readiness and the ability to introduce one another across the interface. Now, and another advantage of the notion, maybe not advantage, maybe another um, interesting point when we talk about interfaces is uh, that we do not, I mean, we can consider these interfaces as boundary objects, of course. But if you, uh, if you look at these boundary objects with a different perspective, you could equally well consider them as relations between the disciplines that are separated by the boundary or by the interface. Now, if you, look, if you, if you use this terminology, then you get something like relational um, thinking, which, which yet gives another tone to the, work, to the notion of, a, of boundary work. Because relations are always two plays, at least. Some, I would say in this case even at least three plays. But at, at least two plays means that relations have one endpoint here and one endpoint there. And when you talk about relations, you're not really talking about objects anymore. Um, thinking in terms of relations changes the attitude that you have when you go into this, into this kind of um, interdisciplinary projects or whatever they are. So I think this is the, the second point. Um, relational thinking might be, I, I'm just saying that, of course this has, to be, this has to be made operative and people have to get used to it, but it, it gives the whole story a different touch. Now, um, so this is the second point. Uh, again, just summarizing this very quickly. Uh, the first point was um, transdisciplinar transdisciplinarity um, need not be only considered as the strongest and most difficult form of it. I think there's a whole spectrum of different types of transdisciplinarity, which I pointed out. And the other, the second point that I wanted to bring out here is um, a kind of terminological shift from boundaries and boundary objects to interfaces and relations. Bridge building, this is, this is the stuff that, that this is all about, right? Thank you very much. <laughs> and don't forget this. All right, thank you very much. First of all, thank you to Harald for jumping in so spontaneously. 
and for advertising his book with uh, due success. <laughs> <laughs> with what success? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so we, we, have, we have a couple of minutes until um, 30 past, and so that leads me to uh, asking for short questions and precise answers. But first of all, perhaps Sabina is interested in responding to this, or do you want to do this later? Yeah, all right, then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Then there is, there's one rule of the game. We have uh, the ETH policy that you do not use this, this kind of mic, but this one. So take it like this here, and then you can, uh, then you can uh, ask a question and so there are two conditions, having a good question and being able to catch this ball. All right? Good. So who, who wants to start? Any questions? Yeah. No, I, I should throw this, but I don't, I don't do this. Thank you so much. Is this a microphone? Is this true? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sabine, for this really wonderful brush up of the history of, um, of our fields, I, I must say, during the last 20, 30, uh, 30 years. As you remember, um, we did, uh, we did tra transdisciplinary research, mainly in the 90s. Uh, you are a sociologist coming from psychology, as I remember. I'm a historian, yes, yes. and we read our journals. We met Hans Jörg, and boundary object became a boundary object for us. But um, I would say I stopped. I stopped reading social, um, the journal Social Studies of Science. I don't know. Perhaps ten years ago, perhaps longer. I don't pay the East fee anymore, and I didn't meet you now for several years. So, what I want to say: we had a really um, intensive collaboration between history, philosophy, and sociology during 20, 30 years. And it was, it was really nice, but we kind of stopped it. Mm -hmm. Is this good news or bad news? <laughs> no, that we stopped that you stopped collaborate, it. and oh, we sorry. do now interesting things. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's, perhaps it's a role model or not for, for all of us. Yeah. Actually, I didn't stop it, did you? <laughs> Maybe I do it with other people and other disciplines yeah, yeah. and other mm -hmm. extradisciplinary stakeholders from, you know, maybe that I'm uh, now at the MCTS, Munich Center for Technology and Society. We do teaching research and public dialogue, so there's a lot of opportunities to interact with all different kinds of people uh, from all kinds of different disciplines and non-disciplinary backgrounds, so professionals or patients or users, what have you. So you really get it the hard way and rethink all these promising vocabularies like you just have to have a joint goal. You just have to share. And you have to share it. You have to find a consensus. I hate it because it's not about consensus so much. You can, and, e and either way, you can, you can uh, interact. Nonetheless, it's much less frustrating in my mind if you just let it go. Talk to each other. Talk to each other again. Have misunderstandings. Try to get it straight, and so on. And it really works if you just let it go and try to engage in constructive misunderstandings. So, you know, there's, um, there are so many efforts, and politically it has become so demanding to interact with everybody at every it's point in time. It depends from... No, from very short-term relationships to longer ones, <coughs> and uh, some will, will accompany you to other inner or transdisciplinary collaborations, you never know. So we rather try and keep up with all these um, efforts at keeping in touch and not just look for the, comp for the consensus, but rather for interacting, whatever comes out of it. Yeah. Sir? Uh, I'm Michal Inyal from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Thank you very much for both of you for a fantastic introduction to the topic, and I promise to be very short. <laughs> uh, uh, so so I, I was um, a bit surprised that the aspect of, uh, that was mentioned uh, very uh, slightly uh, related to the culture aspect mm. of this uh, uh, very important uh, 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 subject. Uh, what I mean by that is that I think it uh, takes much more 
uh, role in, in, in building up or in even a, a understanding and then and do some assessment to the success and failure yeah. of this. Yeah. Uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, this cultural aspect are not only national based or you know gender based or whatever, but also deeply into this disciplinarity mm -hmm. based. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can I can just say very briefly that, for example, in the mathematics world, uh, uh, maybe the most exciting ever uh, meeting in any meeting will be the open question in which a collaborative as aspect is is really uh, uh, asked for. And people are waiting to, to, to this kind of uh, discussion that is, and in other fields, like my field, I, I'm a biologist, at least originally, uh, uh, there is a lot of issues of protecting yourself, not opening. I mean, I'm, of course, generalizing, but uh, uh, some kind of privacy issues. And so the collaborative team, uh, I think, in recent years, become to be something completely different, which is to do more in a larger scale rather than crossing border or interface and so on. So I think it's so much deep into the culture uh, aspect uh, that, that it should be really uh, be one of the main issue in the game. Take it as a comment. I completely agree. I just um, said a few words on organizational culture or epistemic culture. You, of course, can add many more to this. I think actually just the, the principle should be just do it and try and go for it and try to understand and to explain yourself. It's always not about explaining yourself. What is your point of view? Where do you come from? I didn't get it. What is it? What, what is it? Why is it so important for you? For me, it's not important. Why? So ask and ask again. That was my point, right? I think sometimes, let me just uh, very, very quick. Um, sometimes you can even observe that the closer... Yeah, absolutely. The disciplines that collab have, they want to collaborate with one another, the more difficult it becomes. But that's n that is, of course, we want to understand this, and one way to understand this is, of course, psychologically. This we call it the narcissism of small differences, right? Mm -hmm. But between mathematical physics and theoretical physics, there is a huge gap. Mm -hmm. As as a mathematical physic physicist, you can easily talk to a sociologist, but not to a theoretical physicist. But this, is, this is it's very also amazing. a sociological reason for it. No competition, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's right. That's true. That's true too. Yeah. Thank you very much, Savine. Um, you asked for questions and uh, for <laughs> being asked again. And if I well remembered, early in your talk, you were referring to problems dealt uh, with uh, transdisciplinary procedures as politically underdetermined and scientifically or epistemically overdetermined. Not the other way around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was on purpose that I switched okay, it. Okay. Because I'm not quite sure whether this is a, a good ob observation or whether you couldn't find many um, cases or instances where you should turn it around. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to uh, go into the endeavor of uh, defining something, mm -hmm. but is there perhaps a difference between the problems dealt in the mode of transdisciplinarity and the problem of transdisciplinarity now? that would solve this all, uh, that kind of possibility to switch your definition mm -hmm. easily in case for cases like Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. which is politically very close and, yeah? right. and, and scientifically until the last few years, a very clear issue mm -hmm. where you could do research uh, for years and years. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, I give it a try. I didn't define it so much, but rather try to observe a gap, an increasing gap between the political demand for inter trans grand challenge, ever more cooperative or collaborative. You, there's apparently, no end to the story. And on the other hand, we don't know actually how to do 
inter or transdisciplinarily, epistemically, organizationally, and so on. This is what I meant. No? In the increasing gap, ever more grander the collaborative effort and demand and expectation in politics. And while the demand is come, becoming ever bigger, we don't know actually we just, how do we do it on the floor. That is what I meant. No? Uh, I, I should start out by, by uh, excusing myself in advance. I'm, I'm only uh, a programmer as opposed to a, 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 a kind of meta-analyzer uh, of these things. So if what I say is, is time-wasting or banal, then, then, then uh, I apologize in advance. You mentioned, I think around slide 13, around halfway through, uh, the impossibility of translating from uh, what I'm particularly interested in is an epistemological level uh, problems or questions between disciplines, and including very close ones, of course. And experientially, of course, we, we all know that, that it's frequently very difficult to do this. Um, what I wanted to do is question whether it's actually impossible from a, a fundamental point of view. Um, the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, this kind of you know, linguistic relativism, I think uh, anthropological consensus is that the way we uh, prove the Sapir-Whorf the strong Sapir-Whorf hypothesis not to be valid is through poetics. In other words, yes, the Eskimos have 50 words for snow, but we can always find some uh, particularly poetic German way to express uh, a particular type of snow, and therefore it, it's ultimately translatable. Do you think there's the case to be made for some kind of epistemological poetics in the same way, or do you think that's a metaphor being dragged too far uh, and, and it shouldn't be? I don't know whether I can answer that, but <laughs> my answer would be to be the safe side, <laughs> empirically speaking. No? For me, translation can only be observed no, when it comes to collaboration, that boundary objects are created, and thereby people start trying to connect to one thing they consider to be the same, but with a slight angle when I talk about it, and there's a slightly different angle when you talk about it, but it's common ground enough for us in order to interact, to proceed a bit, and maybe find something new, or to reframe the problem, or whatever. So I would approach it from there. Thanks. So I, I would like to encourage also the people sitting in the, in the other room, come over, ask questions. Are there any questions here? I mean, I have enough questions, but... Uh, so then, then I, I do this. Um, <laughs> I, I was wondering because the, uh, uh, in terms of the inter interpretation or definition that you presupposed uh, concerning transdisciplinary research, since one of the most important differentiations or differences between trans and inter is usually that inter is temporary, while <laughs> trans, uh, transdisciplinarity is, is something else, but not temporary. So you, you change the traditional... Definitions right there. Who right? says which one is traditional? <laughs> it's simply another one, right? Mm. Coming from the more sociological edge, right. so to speak. You know? And I think, at least from sociology of science observation, trans means you know, transcending disciplinary boundaries mm. and strongly connected to, say, um, um, environmentally sensible research or uh, research with patients and so on, transgressing disciplinary boundaries. I know what you're saying, you know, that's Mitterstrass. Mm -hmm. He had two ways of saying what trans is. Huh? Mm -hmm. And this is one of it, and mine, mine is another one. No? Right. So these are the two ways of saying trans to trans. Well, it's, 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 a, it's a compliment, uh, a compliment <laughs> to not to be traditional. In, in that sense. Right, exactly. Uh, and there's another question. I mean, I have to raise this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the idiot. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether that was a good choice. Uh, and the, I mean, there, there, there's a point to be made for this, but the idiot in the, the novel is not the one who questions things. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, the, that's the, the trait of character you build uh, your, your sort of your joke on. <clears throat> uh, but uh, the idiot in the novel is the one who's just doing things, uh, I wouldn't say without reflection, uh, um, and not necessarily with yeah, yeah. thoughtfulness, but, but, but just by being completely honest, an honesty that we do not know. That's the idiot. And that is, this, is, this does not match what the scientist is doing there. So I'm not sure whether this is a happy parallel there. It depends, of course, uh -huh. how, what you would say. For instance, 
usually, and this was my point from the very beginning, people say we want to do something together and in the end we want to have a consensus, something new but consensual. I say, don't, don't. Just be an artist, just be a sociologist, just be mm. a philosopher, just be a theologian. And say, I'm but a theologist, I'm but a sociologist. I ask my question the way I can put it and try to become irritated a bit by what you're saying and it gets back and forth and after a while we say something. So in a way that is idiotic. I don't change. I mm. rather tell the, as honestly as I can and I try to be as honest as possible and explain my perspective on this particular problem and try to listen to your stance and you, you come from a different angle. And then we try to interact on that very basis. This is not bad. I think there is deeply rooted kind of morale, morality in this interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary discourse coming together, being one in the end. This is really a bit uh, devastating, right, right. a barrier to interdisciplinarity. So we have a couple of minutes for further questions. Yeah. So be prepared. Good. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. Um, I wanted to know if you think that trans transdisciplinary research is political or, as other authors have suggested, that it's the only way to depoliticize, for example, uh, climate science, where it, some question the climate scientific evidence. Sorry, I didn't quite get it. Trust? Is, do you think yeah. trans, transdiscipl ah. transdisciplinary research is political? Yeah. Or does it serve to depoliticize some science? Neither nor. It can have okay. political um, um, incentives. Hmm? So that means we, we want to solve a certain grand challenge or something. That can be an incentive. But then thereafter, once you engage in collaborative research, you try, of course, to... Um, make collaboration with, an, with several disciplinary epistemic stances, but also experimental, experiential accounts, professional accounts, political accounts, no? Going, um, start getting started no? in a way. So it's not neither nor. It's, it's always a science political endeavor. It's, a, I think, a cross cutting event in a way, right? mostly, unless it's the other trends. <laughs> but even there is some politics going on. <laughs> Thanks. So, further questions? I was uh, wondering, um, just a short question. Um, do these uh, trading zones and these boundary objects always have to be created in you? Because you said you can become an expert in creating these. So, can you give a systematicity, systematicity to, that, to that knowledge? Instead, I mean, you discredited the science of team studies, but... Um, no, I yeah. think I can't. And with this, actually, mm -hmm. I totally agree with the science of science, team science, <laughs> in a way. So it's, it's an art. It's, it's an, kind of an experience. It's a kind of being open to signals. Here's a misunderstanding. Here's something different going on. But don't be afraid of differences. Don't be afraid of boundaries. Just ask and ask again. And this is more or less a matter and a game of principles, not so much as a rule or as a system or a systematic, in my view. Mm -hmm. Other questions? <coughs> yeah, maybe a um, more practical question um, uh, for a university and education in university in a whole. What would you think, um, like how much interdisciplinarity actually do we need like do we should we start to engage students phd candidates and so on it's a little bit maybe your question as well like when and how long in our career do we how much <laughs> of it do we need because yeah. i mean yeah. i did a phd in a in a program which was meant to be interdisciplinary <laughs> and it all promised big things at the mm -hmm, beginning. Mm -hmm. And at the end, everybody of us really stuck to our discipline for the PhD because right. otherwise it, uh, it wouldn't have been possible. So I'm curious what uh, you think. Of course, I can't answer it for all epistemic cultures, so I wouldn't dare to. But uh, it depends. For instance, in my 
field, SDS, globally speaking, it is, of course, very interesting if you have people who are willing to switch perspectives ever more often and who, who of course, get to learn something, start with something, but then, again, um, swiftly adopt a perspective of it's important to switch perspectives, to get to know what the other one is saying, and so on, and to get a problem-oriented view early on. This doesn't deny disciplinary training, of course not, and again, we could talk a lot about how interdisciplinary disciplines are, so that's always, of course, a mix of things. It's only ideal, <coughs> typically speaking. We need, of course, a, a sound basis to start with, but then open up very early on, and my experience is if even with young students, you can really have very good seminars or, and, and field work uh, in the first semester. They are really happy about it and learn, okay, that's my take on it after a while. Uh, so be open, be, be just experimental. That would be my take on it. And uh, whether disciplinary or interdisciplinary or trans, this is not my issue so much, but rather problem-oriented and then try and find out what, what works, right? Different matter is university structure as they are, and career structures as they are. This often differs because they are very, very disciplinary at times, right? That can be competing here. So I have, I have another question. Uh, that this goes back to uh, where you started off. Uh, that was rather, um, I think, a historical um, consideration, namely that something like a transdisciplinary research and then... Um, informed and institutionalized uh, way came out uh, in the 60s or so. <clears throat> and then there was another development, namely opening up scientific research for the society. So what's the relation between this? Is, this? is this just a correlation and coincidence, or is the idea that while we have the, the first one, uh, we were unable to do the, the, the second one or the other around? So w w what's your take on this? I think um, uh, the hidden storyline is the hopes and expectation get ever more bigger. No, right. so it's a, within a dis um, social. Um, leave your discipline. Leave the university structure. Leave the career structure. Go and try to solve problems for the society at large. No, so it's getting ever more bigger. And the gap between what we are expected to solve and deal and treat, uh, as opposed to how we should do it, uh, is getting becoming ever more bigger. Right, that was my problem. <laughs> okay. Another question? Yes. Uh, just, just a small comment. I, I think uh, maybe going back to the educational part, mm. which is very important because. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, uh, often I can see uh, that, um, let's say, uh, the, the, met the scientific methodology, whatever it is, it doesn't matter if it's physics, uh, biology, whatever, but exactly the, the point that you, you raise on, uh, uh, I mean, what's reproducible, what statistic means in different scale, in different resolution, is lacking for most of, uh, let's say, classical humanity-based or social science-based. So, so that by itself uh, is, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a you know, barrier, but, but uh, uh, that by itself is very fundamental for the trust that you mentioned, that I think is a key. So, so this is something that should be like ABC, that you do arithmetic, you do ABC, and you learn the principle of what is an experiment, what is, uh, uh, how can you, break an hypothesis, or so something like that in scientific life. Because without it, it's very, uh, it's remain very flat and uh, uh, with no trust. You want to comment on this? No. Okay. Yeah. All right, good. So we are running out of time. Then please join me in thanking both uh, Sabine and Harold. <laughs> <laughs>